What if there was a way for us to read and write in the language of nature so that we could program living cells the same way we program a computer? In every part of Earth, life has evolved amazing technology. It can eat plastic, make food from sunlight, regrow limbs, live in boiling water, clean toxic waste, grow self-healing building materials and natural medicines, capture carbon, and even make animals age backwards. The most amazing thing about all these examples is that biology solved these problems in much more sustainable and efficient ways than anything humans have come up with. Genetic technology, or gene tech, lets us use DNA to transform the world around us from one full of industrial pollution, unsustainable monocultures, and synthetic medicines to a world full of clean biomanufacturing, sustainable agriculture, and genetic medicines. By finding nature's most useful tricks and using them in new ways, we can solve some of the most difficult problems that our species has ever faced. Within the last few years, we have reached a point where we can use the language of nature to really tackle disease, pollution, and even death. Well, what is genetic engineering? In order for us to understand how it works, we need to really understand what biology even is. Like, what's life made of? What's the difference between a rock and the rock? Well, it's protein. Rocks and other non-living things are made of simple molecules, like silicon or oxygen, and they have their molecules arranged together without any complex structure. But the rock, like all other forms of life, is made of structured molecules called proteins. Proteins aren't just the stuff in your muscle, it's in every part of you. Animals, mushrooms, plants, every living thing is made up of thousands of different proteins all working together. The proteins themselves are made out of normal carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, but they're arranged in such a way that lets them take on a huge variety of complex shapes, like Lego bricks. A protein can be small and inert, like these colorful pigments, or it can be a giant mechanical machine that actively chews up other molecules, like this helicase enzyme that rips apart DNA. There are so many different kinds of proteins, they can do almost anything. Proteins are the key to understanding why gene tech is so amazing. They are really like tiny 3D printed machines that can take on almost any shape or function if you design them correctly. And this is why life is able to accomplish such a crazy range of tasks. Nothing else in the universe can do this, because proteins require the equivalent of a computer program to even make them. But how are there so many kinds of proteins? And where's the program that makes them? Where's that data stored? How can your body be keeping track of the almost 30,000 proteins that make up the human body? And making sure that each one is in the right place, at the right time, in the right amount? Well, the answer is DNA. Inside each of the cells of your body, and all life on Earth, there's a very long rope of DNA. This DNA tells the cells exactly what proteins to make and when. In every cell on the planet, the DNA holds all the information needed to make thousands of different proteins. You can think about DNA as kind of like a hard drive that stores all the data needed to make an organism. The same way this video is stored on YouTube's server, or how I have 180 gigabytes of biology memes on my desktop. The DNA code needed to make a single protein is called a gene. And the more complicated that a protein is, usually the longer the DNA sequence needed to make it. Small proteins, like maybe that colorful pigment, only need a short gene to make them. But some proteins can be really big, like one of these bad boys. This is a helicase enzyme. It spins around so fast, it's like a jet engine. These mechanical kinds of proteins are called enzymes. And they're like little nanobots that can actively move around and make repairs or break down other molecules. Some enzymes are so complex that they're made up of many different proteins stuck together. But the important thing to remember is that the proteins are coded and stored as DNA. So when we add new DNA to a living cell, it's gonna read it and start making the proteins that we want. Now we know what proteins are and how they get made from reading DNA, so let's try to code some. Why don't we start with melanin? That's the brown pigment that each of us have in our hair, eyes, and skin. 
And even though melanin isn't a protein itself, it's made by a protein, an enzyme called tyrosinase. This same brown pigment isn't just made for humans. It's also used by bacteria and even in plants. Ever forget about some bananas on the counter and watch them turn black? That's melanin. The enzyme tyrosinase that's gonna make melanin for us is coded by about 1,350 digits of DNA, called base pairs. So let's make some. First thing I need to do though is program the DNA. We usually code DNA in a circle because it's easier to move around and there are no loose ends. This ring of DNA, which has my gene in it, along with some other important pieces of code, is called a plasmid. There are other parts of the plasmid that are like formatting. They help make sure my gene is being made correctly. So when I'm coding my plasmid, it's important to also control when the gene makes the proteins. I can do this with something called a promoter, which is a piece of code that tells the cell when to start making the protein. Depending on where that cell is and what kind of cell it is, the promoter lets it know when to make that protein and how much. In this case, I want the melanin in skin, so let me make sure to use a promoter that works in skin cells. The promoter always goes right before the gene that it influences, so I'm gonna put it right here. Once I finish coding, it's time to make it into actual DNA. And this is an important difference between genetic engineering and computer programming. Unlike a computer where I can just type in some code and run it, we actually need a physical copy of this DNA if we wanna use it. The plasmid code looks like this, and when we put it into cells, it starts running like an app. All right, so looks like our coding is done. Time to print out the DNA. These days, the easiest way to get DNA is just to synthesize it from scratch, like a special 3D printer. So I need to send the file of what I want to a DNA synthesis company where they're gonna print it out for me. Printing it costs about nine cents a base pair, so that means this gene's gonna cost maybe 125 bucks. All right, so I'm just gonna send them an email with the file, and now we just gotta wait until they give it to us. Well, that was fast. So they send us the DNA in this little tube. So now I have the plasma that's gonna make melanin in skin cells. That means if I insert this DNA into skin cells, they're gonna start turning brown. It's worth pointing out that the way I've designed my plasmid means that it's never actually gonna integrate into my skin cells natural DNA. It's gonna stay separate as a little plasmid floating around inside the cells. In the next episode, where I talk more about what is gene therapy, we'll go into more detail about this. But for now, I'll just say that it works just as well and it's much safer. Well, now you've seen what genetic engineering actually looks like. We grab the code for proteins usually ones that already exist, and copy and paste them where we want them to be. There, they'll make exactly the protein that we program them to. This lets us move traits around very precisely. We always know exactly what a piece of DNA is gonna do no matter where it goes. This is the same technology that nature uses to make changes as organisms evolve. In fact, we're definitely not the only organisms out there moving around DNA like this. Genetic engineering is a natural process, and it happens all the time in nature without human intervention. For example, sometime about 8,000 years ago, a virus infected a wild sweet potato and inserted some foreign genes, probably from another plant, and it made the sweet potato grow bigger and faster. Ancient people noticed this and used the mutant potato to cultivate bigger and better varieties. We know this happened because we can see the DNA left over from this ancient genetic engineer. Every variety of modern sweet potato now contains this foreign DNA and it proved to be very important in the domestication of the sweet potato. So when I say that genetic engineering is a natural process, I mean it literally. In another example, psychedelic mushrooms probably evolved their trippy chemicals by stealing and inserting DNA from other mushrooms around them that had figured out a way to mimic proteins from the insects that attacked them. The fungus figured out that if it made its own version of these brain chemicals, then bugs and hippies that ate it would have their brain scrambled. But you actually don't even need to go that far to see examples of genetic engineering. Actually, you yourself are already heavily genetic engineered. Almost 20% of all of your DNA is just leftover pieces of viruses that inserted completely random genes into your ancestors for millions of years. So now the fun part. Let's actually use our gene mod. We know that DNA would work in any organism we put it in. Melanin could be made by bacteria, plants, or fungi, but I designed this plasmid specifically for skin cells, so let's try it out in that. I've got my DNA suspended right here in water. It's gonna be important for us to move around, so 
first stage is to take it out with a small gauge needle. Okay, got to make sure all the air is out. All right, now I'm going to clean up my injection site. Now the plan is to put this naked DNA right in between my layers of skin. So let me just make sure I got my angle right. There we go, I can feel it. Now I'm gonna use this machine that actually helps push that DNA into my skin cells. I can feel it, it kinda hurts. Move it around a little, make sure I'm hitting as many skin cells as possible. <laughs> All right. That should work. Let's check back on it in a few days and see how it comes along. Whoa, did I really just genetically modify myself? Yep. How does that even work? How did I get the plasmid into my cells? Is that safe? Is this real? It's definitely real. But if you want to know the rest, you're going to have to stay tuned for the next episode where we talk about what is gene therapy. That's where we're going to find out how all this cool gene tech actually works in humans. How is it actually going to extend our lives, cure cancer, or give us new abilities? Well, see you next time on Gene Hub.